High performance athletes are not simply born, they are the result of thousands of hours of dedicated effort by the athlete, coaches, parents, and many others, all pulling in the same direction. The end game for some is a career. More broadly, getting young people into sports can set them on the right track for lifelong fitness. With us to consider all of that, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, former CFL football player Mark Verbeek, now manager of Innovation at Sport for Life, and a teacher and assistant athletic director at Hillfield Strathallen College in Hamilton. And with us here in studio, Patricia Longmuir, senior scientist at CHEO Research Institute, that's the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. She's also an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Ottawa. Nick Waddy is here. He's a sports scientist in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Ontario Tech University. Beth McCharles, mental performance coach who has worked with multiple university athletic associations. And Sean Fitzgerald, managing editor of The Athletic in Toronto and author of the forthcoming book about youth hockey. It's called Before the Lights Go Out. And we're going to do this program before our lights go out here. Great to have everybody here uh, in our studio. And Mark, great to meet you on the line from Winnipeg. I gather you're there for a physical literacy conference. So why don't we just start there and have you define for us, what do you mean by physical literacy? Yeah, physical literacy is uh, basically the the competence and confidence to participate uh, in activity for life uh, in a brief definition. And that occurs in multiple environments uh, with multiple experiences, uh, which allow you to kind of value uh, movement for uh, the lifespan. In layman's terms, you got to know how to kick a soccer ball, throw a baseball, shoot a hockey puck, that kind of stuff? You got it. That's it. Okay. And um, why do you believe it is particularly important for young people to have those skills? Well, I think what it does is it uh, those we do kind of define them as fundamental movement skills as the kind of the foundational part of it. And just like you would learn uh, reading where you start with your letters and, and you know, those letters then turn into words and words turn into uh, sentences and sentences into stories. It's the same with physical literacy. That development is actually uh, takes time and, and, and some intention. So as kids start to learn these different um, these different skills along their experiences and their journeys, in these different environments and luckily in Canada kids have a, a plethora of those uh, to, to choose from. Uh, it develops this foundation of, uh, of um, fundamental movement skills that allows them to kind of participate in whatever uh, activities they, they want to venture in. That includes activities of daily living uh, to high performance sport. Beth, you are essentially what uh, we would call in layman's terms a sports psychologist, right? That's right. Okay. How do you motivate kids to want to develop their physical literacy? Great question. Um, you know, there's a lot of different components to that. It, it depends if your kid is super motivated internally just to get out there and get outside and practice what they're, what they're doing and being creative. And there's other kids that like to be more indoors mm. and on video games or television or whatnot. They're so the tough sell, I presume. They're the tough sell. So mm -hmm. what you need to do is, you know, set boundaries in, in, in the household and parents, and it's really hard, but try to get them motivated to and educate them on the importance of getting outside and creative play and just being outdoors. Patricia, I want to follow up with you on that because I think, well, I, certainly in, in my neighborhood when I was a kid, every day after school, I mean every day, road hockey, street football, whatever it was, right. that's not the case anymore. So how do you get kids who might not be inclined to chase after physical literacy to do it? Um, well, I think one of the most important things is to just limit screen time and get kids outside. That'll make you popular. And yes, it will. It's not popular necessarily, but um, we know that even if you don't tell kids they have to be active, if you just get them outside, they will be more active. And I think it's really important what you said about after school, bunch of kids on the street. That's the piece that's missing right now, and, it, mm -hmm. and it's showing up that, that is, that's a critically important piece for a lifelong love of physical activity as kids of different ages playing together, learning to play, setting their own rules, not having adults guide everything that they're doing, mm -hmm. but figuring it out themselves on how to play and be active and have fun with whatever, whoever shows up. One of your colleagues, I gathered, did a study on this. Kids 8 to 12, how close are they to meeting what you would consider to be a basic standard for physical literacy? Um, they're not. Mark and I um, published some data last year. Mark on, Trombley. Yeah, Mark Trombley mm -hmm. over, on over 10,000 Canadian children, and only about a third of the Canadian children that we tested are meeting the recommended level of physical literacy. So, a third? Yeah, so two-thirds are, are not 
Um, we say they're beginning or progressing their physical literacy journey, but they definitely need to improve in various aspects of physical literacy. And it includes not only those fundamental motor skills, but things like their motivation for physical activity, their confidence for physical activity, their knowledge about physical activity, their physical fitness, and their ability to participate. Um, so it's a variety of factors, but yeah, it's only one third. I'm gonna get Sean in here now. You've written a book about your attempt to get your kids involved in physical literacy before the lights go out. How did that journey go for you? Well, I have uh, two children, uh, my, my eldest. He is absolutely involved in hockey. He lives and breathes it. He is uh, uh, part of a Rock Carrier story. He is on the, the back of the $5 bill. He's <laughs> skating, he's, he's made friends, um, he plays hockey all the time, he watches hockey, he trades hockey cards. And his younger sister is, is going into hockey school this fall. Um, so we're, we're in that and, and we're starting to see the, the benefits of it. It's, it's the physical literacy, it's the confidence, it's the ability to, to interact with other children. And, and frankly, you know, he has a, a Fitbit now where he's now marching, matching his output yesterday with what, what he hopes to accomplish tomorrow and competing with friends. How so old is he again? He's eight years old. And he's got a Fitbit on already. A little Fitbit on, yeah. It's, it's, it's all the rage. You got to get down to the schools to see what's going on here. Huh. <laughs> Okay. How about your experiences, Nick? You got two kids as well, eh? No, no. No. I know we're expecting our first in August, actually. So I'm gonna have to get them outside running and oh, okay. doing all sorts of stuff, um, and no screens. I'll make sure. I'll make <laughs> You'll sure vote that for happens, that. Pat. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Uh, no. In terms of physical literacy, so uh, most of my research and work is in um, developing high-performance athletes, and so um, physical literacy is something that's that's quite often coming up. I think, to me, it depends a little bit on 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 the child and, and who you're actually looking at. If, if a child's in sport, they're highly active, physical literacy is largely not an issue. Um, if they're not, if they're simply trying to get their physical activity either at home or in physical education class, maybe that's where, where it's looking. Um, the other issue uh, for me is, is you know, physical literacy is, is a very kind of broad thing. There's lots of different components to it. Catching, throwing, kicking, running, hopping, all these different types of skills. Mm. Um, and to your point, Pat, I think it's, it's about finding, you know, what does that child enjoy yep. then that they can derive some confidence from and, and some, you know, enjoyment from and go there. I mean, I had, you know, friends in school that couldn't catch or throw to save their lives, but they mm -hmm. could just run like lightning and cross country. Mm -hmm. and, so and find something. Find something. Find what you enjoy. Find what you're good at. And I think, I think that's what we need to tease apart a little bit with physical literacy is because is, it's, it's a big, it's a big complicated yeah. combination of things. I misspoke a second ago. I, I, I gave Mark's two kids to you for some reason. It's actually Mark who's got the, is the other person here with, the, with uh, the two kids. And just tell us about how you're handling this whole physical literacy thing for them. Well, and again, to, to what the, the points that have been brought up, I think it's really about kind of finding, um, you know, the niche for your kids. And, and for me, I know, uh, you know, from my background, uh, in high performance sport, but also just uh, being kind of less uh, pressure on uh, the performance side and more on the exploration. So my guys are uh, nine and five years old and they are definitely different profiles. Uh, my son has been involved in sports since he was uh, four years old and my daughter the same. Uh, so it's more about um, them exploring different environments and, and as a parent providing them opportunities to get in water, to, you know, to do trampoline, to, to, to be able to play with more organized, structured uh, activities like soccer and, and just giving them a wide range of uh, opportunities and, you know, getting them outside, like, like was said earlier, like just allowing them to go out and explore their neighborhood, their backyard and, and not being so um, structured in terms of their time. I'm going to pull a little audible here. Sheldon, I need a close-up. Which camera you want to do it on? Beth, get that baby finger up here for a second. <laughs> <clears throat> I want everybody to see. This is, okay, hold your baby finger up. Okay, can we get a close-up shot of Beth's baby finger? Because that, that is the finger of somebody who played soccer as a 15-year-old and broke it. And somebody, uh, what did the coach say? My coach said, he said, well, you have nine more, so keep going. <laughs> <laughs> now, th th that's an interesting approach to take to try to get somebody to do physical literacy. It obviously didn't throw you off the path because here you're still doing it. That's true. Why, why did it not intimidate you to try something else? <sighs> um, well, one, back then, the, the coach, what the coach said, I did. You did. So he mm -hmm. said, do 22 laps, or she said, and I, I did what, what they said, and that's just how I was... I was molded and how I was driven in athletics. I always wanted to get better, and that was just who I was. You got three kids? 
I have three kids. And they're all involved, obviously. All involved, all very different. And if a coach had said to one of your kids, just snap it back into place, you got nine more fingers, get back out there? I, I would have a different answer. <laughs> <laughs> that would be more probably. How about in terms of the genders, do you, do you approach what you do differently if it's a male athlete versus a female athlete? For me, it wouldn't be about the genders, it would be about the person. So I have two boys and a girl, and each one of them is completely motivated in a different style. Hmm. So one of them would be, wants to practice and practice and practice, and one of them's a natural athlete, but if I gave them the Nintendo for 12 hours, they would use it. They do that too. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, as they grow, you just have to look at their profile, like Mark said, and kind of, mold it just like coaching or teaching we have to teach the individual as opposed to one per person for everybody hmm. or one way for everybody yeah i, th I think i've got a i, I hope a, a useful follow-up for mark here in as much as i have heard that if you had a bad experience as a kid in gym class which is what you teach after all chances are your physical literacy will be lousy for the rest of your life conversely if you enjoyed gym as a kid it's not going to be an issue for the rest of your life how do you make phys ed more enjoyable so that we get more kids, obviously, turning into adults who want to be physically literate? Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with just the premise of it, it being physical education and not gym class. Like, I think we've all kind of come from a world um, where we do phys ed in gym, but uh, phys ed occurs in multiple environments now. There's more schools that are you know, doing swimming uh, to survive programs. There's more ice skating happening and, and curling. And so just that whole understanding that uh, phys ed is really the curriculum of teaching kids how to move and that it happens in a gymnasium. So as physical educators, as we approach um, our students and look at them, uh, you know, collectively, but individually, we're trying to fill the gaps uh, so that they can you know develop these fundamental movement skills and and move better and and have a want to to move better so everybody's on this physical literacy journey it's just a matter of uh, how much experiences and exposure and how much they value movement in their lives and any sense about how we compare in the province of Ontario to uh, the rest of Canada I think it's pretty standard across the board I mean it's a, it's a it's a problem that we're seeing across, and if we look at our, our neighbors to the south, they're probably, if you look statistically, they're about five years ahead of us, so they're having a lot more issues around obesity and, and early childhood diseases and things like that. So hmm. uh, we're learning a lot from them and, and trying to really get the message out around uh, physical literacy and, and how to develop it and making sure for that and, and quality sport happens uh, at the volunteer level as all the way up to the high performance. One of the things that may inhibit us getting better at this, and you had three kids in hockey, you have three kids in hockey, mm -hmm. and your kids are in hockey. You had any kids in hockey? No, uh, niece and nephew. Niece and nephew, okay. I had kids in hockey. Uh, here's the thing, becoming an athlete is expensive, or it sure can be. And this is something, I wanna read a little excerpt here. Uh, many of you may have heard of Wayne Simmons. He's originally from the province of Ontario, had a good run with the Nashville Predators in the playoffs this year. And here's what he had to say about this. By the time I turned 16, I was still playing double-A hockey because my family sim simply couldn't afford the triple-A registration fees. The Toronto Junior Canadians came to scout me and they offered me a spot on their team. It was pretty much my last chance to step up a level and keep my dream alive, but the registration fee was $5,000. My aunts and uncles chipped in. My dad went to the owner of his construction company and got him to chip in. So many people helped me. It was up to me to come up with the rest. So all summer long, I woke up every morning with my dad at 5 a.m. and we were out at the construction site by six. By the end of the summer, I came up with the last 2,500 bucks for the registration fee and I was a junior Canadian. It was my ticket into junior hockey. Wayne came from a family of five kids. His dad worked construction, his mom was a secretary. They made the impossible possible and you know, Let's say it, fabulous, it worked out for him. He's on a six year contract, he's making 24 million bucks on the contract, so it worked out for him. Is this the typical minor hockey experience though? Yes, no. Um, yes. The, the hockey that, that we talk about and we think about when we close our eyes and you see the, you know, maybe the Tim Hortons commercial of people skating on ponds in you know, a nice snowfall, it doesn't happen anymore. The Hamilton Spectator did a really interesting piece uh, three years ago where they 
uh, reached out to all 20 Ontario Hockey League franchises and requested the postal codes of each of those, the kids on the roster. So there's no personal information on them where they came from. They heard back from 13 of the 20, and so it worked out to about 220 players. And what they found was that 80% of those players came from postal codes where the the average income was, was much higher than the provincial average, um, and, and some were much, much higher. And, and overwhelmingly now they come from, from urban areas. So the, the, the composite sketch that you would have now of, of somebody who does get on that track to elite hockey, or even, it's not even elite hockey now, it's single A, it's double A, it's getting in, it's, mm -hmm. it costs a lot of money. It's, and not just the, the hard capital investment, it's the time. So do you have access to a car? Do you have the flexibility to get out to a 5 p.m. practice on a Wednesday? Are you able to give up every weekend for games, practices, tournaments? The, the barriers that have been allowed to grow around hockey in particular, but to a larger extent other sports as well, but I'm focusing on hockey because it was on the back of our currency, um, the barriers are significant. So Patricia, what do we do about that? Well, I think um, obviously encouraging kids to have a variety of interests and have hockey just to be one part of their their life is really important. We know, for example, that only 30% of kids involved in organized sport will continue beyond the age of 11 or 12. And, really? Yeah, That's so 70% so, so 70, huh. 70 drop out um, before they enter their teenage years. And then from those um, of the 30%, only about 10% will continue on beyond their high school years. So you've got 3% of the kids who started continuing beyond the high school years. And only one in a hundred of that three percent will get any sort of scholarship. So this myth that we're going to get, you know, our kids' university is going to be paid if I get them to specialize is really such a small, small percentage, and they're missing out on a lot of the fun times that that you talked about every day after school, playing with friends on the street. If you have to go to gymnastics practice or you have to go to hockey practice, you miss out on that. Being well-rounded human beings, mm -hmm. huh. right? Mark, let me get you on that because I know we've had Carl Subban in this studio before and he's talked about the fact that uh, I think he was spending 15000 a year to register his three sons for their minor hockey leagues at one point. Now, uh, again, it worked out for the Subans. I got three kids in the NHL and that's wonderful. But what do players from lower socioeconomic backgrounds do about this? Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with the sport. And uh, I think, you know, as phys ed teachers and as uh, sport leaders, we really got to look at how uh, we can diversify, uh, you know, children's portfolio. So allow them to have multiple experiences and in, in different places and spaces. Because, as was mentioned, the if we're, you're looking at it in terms of the long term, going beyond just the, the financial side of it, you want them to enjoy movement for life and that can be, you know, running the local marathon to playing some organized uh, club or rec. Um, so I think students, you know, there are, are barriers to, to cost. I mean, I played football because it was really cheap. They, they rented you the equipment and, uh, and I enjoyed hitting people uh, really hard and, <laughs> and being allowed to do that. Um, but it opened up a lot of opportunities in other sports. I played uh, varsity uh, basketball, varsity volleyball. Um, so it was really compartmentalized in the seasons. And as was mentioned, the more uh, experiences, the more fr friends. Um, a guy I played with uh, is here now doing a uh, curriculum consultant for PE, and he was on my basketball team in Hamilton. So it, it does open up your network, and it's more than just about uh, the high performance and, and getting that scholarship. It's about the friends and the fun and, and, and enjoying the journey as you're going through. Hmm. Uh, with apologies to the rest of you, um, Mark's my favorite guest. He played for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, so I'm going to sh I'm just going to de declare my bias right up front, right there, and uh, tell you, Mark, as well, that uh, we're about to lose our satellite. So I want to thank you for sh uh, showing up and uh, joining us on TVO tonight and contributing to our program. Thanks very much. Preach for having me. Thank you, Oski Wee Wee, as they say. All right. Uh, can we also now? There's this. Again, there is this dream, and you hear about the odd story where, for example, let's take Matt Duchesne. Matt Duchesne, also another guy who's had a nice playoff run this year. 13 years in minor hockey. His father estimates that he invested more than $300,000, mm -hmm. which included a loss of income because his dad couldn't, I guess he was in real estate and he couldn't be showing people Work. homes mm -hmm. because he was always driving Matt to a conference, or to, to games, rather. Now, Matt's on a five-year, $30 million contract, so it all worked out for Matt. 
Are, are any of your kids going to be in the National Hockey League, do you think? Probably not. <laughs> no, right. and that's not my expectation either. And But this is the thing, right? We, we, mm -hmm. we, st we, we sometimes get our kids involved in all of this because we hope there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and yeah. that's going to be the experience of one one millionth of a percent of the people involved, right? If my kids are playing beer hockey at the end of the day, and still when they're 60 or 70 and playing... You're happy. Success. Right. Yes, and they have that those networks and those connections. Yeah, I, but there, like we said before, there's a lot of pressure, not only just to get them on the ice um, and to pay the, the fee just to get them in, it's, it's the pressure of private practices mm -hmm. and extra skills mm -hmm. and all of this where parents are involved, so it's trying to keep up with the next person. And it's a real thing, and it's a real problem out there. Nick, what is the risk of a player specializing in a sport at too young an age? Well, there's, um, there's also, I mean, there's, there can be a risk of injury. Um, there can be a decrease of enjoyment of the sport, so you know, something like burnout. Um, you hear that a lot, don't you? You do hear that a lot. Um, there, there's lots out there on, you know, do, should kids specialize early? Should they play lots of different sports? Um, to be honest, that, that discussion is, is kind of like the, in, in my world, it's a bit like the, the animal farm. It's instead of two legs versus four, it's, you know, Diversify good, specialize bad. <laughs> um, to be honest, I actually, I actually don't think we've got as concrete of evidence on, on, to have that distinction. Um, I think, um, you know, there's lots of different ways to participate in sport. Um, the definitions of each of those is kind of tricky. You know, what is specializing? Do you specialize well, in just one sport? Is it year round? How competitive does it have to be? Well, let's put it this way. Wayne Gretzky always said one of the reasons he was mm -hmm. a great hockey, such a great hockey player, the greatest hockey player, is that he played baseball in the summer. Mm -hmm. He was able for a few months a year to get away from hockey so that when he came back to it in the fall, he felt rejuvenated. Now, is there something to that? Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I think it might depend on the, on the child. Um, if that's what it takes for them to be motivated and stay motivated and enjoy a sport. Um, the flip side is if you have an athlete and they're completely passionate about, say, hockey, um, is it good to force them into another activity that they want nothing to do with or to be into? Well, it's, a big, it's a big question mark. Yeah. I don't think we have the answers to that yet, well, but, we, um, but we, it's, some, yeah, it's some of the things that are driving some really interesting research in Ontario right we now. We got some debating points here. And Patricia, I'll get you to comment on these first, because we're going to bring up a series of tweets here. Uh, because, you know, there is a view out there that you should try to do something else other than the thing that you're mostly passionate about in the off-season. Yep. Uh, you know, just because. Uh, here's a tweet, one person tweeted, sounds good, but as the parent of a hockey player, baseball player, when September, October comes around, the kids who are in year-round hockey have a leg up at tryouts. It's only peewee, but diversification will cost my son a spot on teams. Okay, that's one tweet. Next one. This is from Grant Fuhrer, who used to play goal for the Edmonton Oil yeah. Oilers and uh, Toronto and Buffalo and St. Louis. And, anyway, Grant Fuhrer weighed in saying he disagrees with that and that when his hockey season ended, he played ball. And for a couple of years, football. And in his words, I don't feel it hurt my chances of making any teams. I found I was mentally fresher and excited to go to tryouts. Let's do one last one. Another parent saying, don't disagree with the concept. It just isn't a practical option. There is no time for other sports when you play at the level my kids are at. Okay, Patricia, discuss. <laughs> well, I think, um, I think we have to sort of dispel the myth that early specialization automatically leads to greater success. In fact, we've done research, or not me, but others have done research that have looked at um, athletes playing at the NCAA level, for instance, or the professional level. And if you take something like football, 13% of football players who are playing at that level did football only during their career. The other 87% did diversified sports and only picked up specialized in their sport. And it, it's not just football, it's track, it's other, you know, other things as well. And clearly didn't hurt that 80 plus percent. No, and, uh, and the other thing that's important to consider is, is children, especially young children, are developing and their bodies are still developing. So if you break your leg when you're, you're 25, you break your leg and you get over it and it heals. If kids break their leg in certain places, you can damage the great growth plates and then their leg no longer grows. And so there are huge injury risks. And we know about 50% of athletic injuries that the sports medicine docs like Sasha Carson at our institution see are overuse injuries in kids who have specialized in a particular sport. 
And um, so the recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics is that um, for children and up until they're beyond puberty, they should have at least two days a week off from their sport during the season and they should have one month off from the sport three times during the year, three separate times during the year. So not a three month block, but three one month blocks. And that gives you the best chance to minimize the chance for overuse injuries related to sport specialization. Hmm. You want to weigh in? Yeah, Hockey Canada is moving towards trying to emphasize the importance of not spending year round and under artificial lighting in a cold arena. It seems intuitive, but <laughs> um, you know, it's it's things like you know hips. Mm -hmm. You think about the repetitive movements of hockey. You think about goalies, like thirteen-year-old goalies with the hips of people much much older than thirteen years old, mm -hmm. um, and getting out. And, and yes, it was the physiological aspect of it, but there's also the burnout. That I mean, you mentioned earlier about the. The, the children who burn out before they even hit their teenage years because it's not fun anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Ray Ferraro is a longtime NHL player working now for TSN and, and said that, yeah, it, as soon as he was done, as soon as his team was eliminated from the hockey playoffs, the rule was that they put the bag in the darkest, coldest corner of the basement, picked up the baseball mitt and didn't go back to that bag until September. Hockey Canada is now slowly trying to move tryouts from the spring now to the fall. So right now, a lot of teams try out for the spring. So what that does is it turns around, you have spring hockey, you have summer hockey, and then all of a sudden you're back in September. They're trying to move tryouts to September in the bid to push the season back so that when your season's done in the spring, you're free for the summer. Mm -hmm. It's in theory, it works out really mm -hmm. well. Yeah. How much, Beth, of this do you think is parents living vicariously through their kids and hoping for that big Wayne Simmons, Matt Duchesne payday? Um, do you see it? Yeah, you do I see, see it. it. Yeah, I see two types of parents that come to, to my practice, and one of them is, please let them just go to the dance and be regular people because they are that, you know, into their sport, and that's all they want to do. So they come to me and be like, he or she needs to be more well-rounded. Let's work on that. And then the flip side, it's this is all they do. And I've, I've had parents um, ask me to help their kid come back from concussion when the doctor has recommended them not play ever again. Um, I declined. Um, it's not part of my values, but this is what we're working with, with parents, and I do think it really happens. I think the parents live through their children and don't really understand that we, at the end of the day, we need to develop well-rounded, kind people for the next generation. But I also think it's often the kids themselves, at least I see it, I see parents as well, but mm -hmm. I also see it in the kids themselves. If you have a child who naturally has a very competitive personality, then they want to be on the A team. They never want to play rec. Mm -hmm. You know, when they play King of the Castle at recess, they have to be at the top of the mm -hmm. King of the Castle and they just naturally go that way. So that if you try to put them into another sport mm -hmm. and go to swing lessons or something where they're the slowest kid because all they've done is mm -hmm. play hockey, yeah. that naturally they, they don't it's like it and they're ve they very re resist it a lot. But I think it's really important to keep those options open because often kids don't get to try very many different types of physical activity when they're children. You know, we have hockey, soccer, baseball, but, but things like, um, you know, gymnastic, rhythmic gymnastics or uh, fencing or some of the other, you know, wrestling, some of the other uh, Olympic sports where you can succeed at a very high level don't really come into play for young children. And so if they don't, if they have only tried one sport, then they really don't have the background and skills to move into those other types of sports once those opportunities become what available. What I find with that mm -hmm. is that when you're working with that natural athlete, that that's all they want to do is at 15 when they fail for the first time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's devastating. It's devastating mm -hmm. and they don't have the tools or the resilience to push through mm -hmm. and it is stress and it's anxiety and it's a, it's a huge thing for these kids at 14 to go through. That's, mm -hmm. what, that's when you come in then. That right? I, I do come That's in. That's when the sports yeah. psychologist comes in. But if they in. played in the playground and had resilience and failed more there in other sports, then they would have more tools. They'd be ready this, for it. This is where the parenting comes in. That, I mean, you talk about choice and what kids want to do. Like, my kids like ice cream. They would eat ice cream all the time. <laughs> Frankly, so would I, but don't tell them that. Kids, <laughs> stop watching now. Um, but as a parent, I say, well, yes, you can have some ice cream, but you also have to eat your Brussels sprouts and get your fibers and all that stuff. Parents 
and I, I hate to keep blaming parents for this, but it's true that they have to drive the bus. They have to understand that the end result, whether you're playing elite soccer and mangling your pinky finger, or whether you're, <laughs> whether you're playing high level hockey, it's the end result isn't getting the scholarship. It's not going to the NHL. It's right. you win as a parent if your child is out of university and 25 years old and says, I'm gonna go play beer league hockey, that they pick up that love and the physical literacy mm -hmm. and they pick that up for life, mm -hmm. that, that you're helping them make healthy lifestyle choices. They're going to be more physically active. That's, that's the gold medal for a parent. Nick, you wanna weigh in? Yeah, I think there's a couple things that, that kind of jumped to mind here. I mean, um, you know, again, the, this early specialization is the villain. I think um, it's the role of parents, coaches, sport organizations to, um, to decide you know, you can have developmentally appropriate sport, like, you know, right volume, right intensity, um, you know, focus on fun, not too much competition, et cetera. Um, so that if a child is participating, you can have those safeguards in place so that if a kid is playing one sport, it's not automatically bad. The other thing that I think is really important to realize here, and I mean, not a parent yet, but maybe you guys and Mark maybe could have ch chimed in, but, um, <laughs> you know, Putting your kids in three plus sports a year um, to be able to one, afford that, to have the time to drive them to those sports, um, pay for those sports. Not everyone can do that. That message that you should be diverse playing all those sports, mm -hmm. it's simply not possible for the, I would say the majority of Canadians. Um, and so in that context, what do you do? Um, well, but it doesn't even have to be organized, Nick. Well, what happened, to, sh what happened to shooting hoops after school, you know, with right. the, you know, on the playground? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's a, another kind of a, different part of the, the problem is that we're not, broadly as a society, we're not letting kids go out and play mm -hmm. on their own anymore. Mm -hmm. um, there's a great book called The Coddling of the American Mind that describes mm -hmm. precisely this trend. And, and it's actually, it, the result is that um, it's delaying adulthood um, for, for teenagers um, mm -hmm. because they're not getting to explore, get in trouble, do risky things, learn resilience, mm -hmm. that type of stuff. Um, so I think it's all part and par parcel for sure. Yeah, it doesn't have to be structured by yeah. any means. And I also think that um, we probably should look at the variation in quality of physical education in the schools in Ontario. Um, we don't, our, it, when you go through teacher education and get your teaching degree, you have between two and a half hours and maybe a half a day in your entire teacher education training focused on physical education. Hmm. So if you come, you know, if you've gone through university and you've taken history or whatever, you have that two and a half hour lecture on physical education in order to teach physical education as an elementary school teacher for your entire career to well, your children. That just tell us what we think about the priority we're putting on physical health. Well, it does. And and so needless to say, when we actually look at the quality of physical education in schools, it varies tremendously depending on how much effort the teacher and, and resources and resilience, if the teacher has a big family, you know, their own family and things to look after, they don't have time to take extra courses or they may not have the interest. Um, in Quebec, by contrast, you have to be a physical education specialist to teach physical education in the elementary school levels. And I think that that is uh, at least one step we could look at taking in Ontario to try and give kids a broader base on the fundamental movement skills. Let me throw another angle on the table here. And to that end, I want to find out what the sports psychologist thinks about a minor hockey game in this province last October. Eight-year-olds from Kitchener beat another team from Cambridge 41 to nothing. What do we think about that? I think it's, I, I think there's so many other ways to handle that situation. Yeah, I was just in a, in a, a tournament, there's my Cape Breton accent coming out. Um, <laughs> and what they did was anytime there was up by four, they stopped it. And then when the other team scored, they put one more up on the other team. Okay. It was a great concept. No one really knew what was going on. The kids didn't notice much. And I think that was just one way to, to cover the, the huge diversity within the within the game. Is anybody having fun in a forty-one nothing game? No. No. They're, Even the guys who are on the forty-one. No, they're not. No, no they're, they're not. not enjoying no it fun either. No. no. They're probably having more fun than the team they're on those hills. For side. sure. Yeah. But at a certain point, it gets kind of pointless, yeah. doesn't it? And my question yeah. is, who's involved in that situation that's not yeah. creating the change for these young eight-year-olds? Well, yeah. And I think that speaks to a broader problem that I'm sure you you you've seen in hockey that. Um, the coaches, these teams, they're trying, their priority is winning now 
and not the development of the athletes mm -hmm. in the long term. Right. Not the development of skills, skills. motivation, yeah. resilience, those types of life skills even, right. positive mm -hmm. youth development. Um, it's, you know, they're picking the biggest kids, the kids that give them the chance to win the most in the moment. Um, and that ends up hurting, you know, talent development long term, um, if we're talking about it at the highest level. Um, and yeah, it can lead to can lead to things like that. Mm -hmm. Shrinks the pyramid. I mean, the, the, that's why Hockey Canada, in a lot of ways, is now moving towards a European model where um, you know kids in Sweden don't see a scoreboard until they're about 12 or 13 years old. Huh. It's development and the, the game to the, the game to practice ratio here, where it could be you know one game to one practice or you know one to two. It's it, it's the other way around. You mm -hmm. might practice three times and, and have a game gotcha. that's not kept score. Week. Gang, that's our time. I got to jump in here because Beth and I have to go off and compare broken fingers. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming on to TVO tonight, helping us out with this. Thanks so much. And uh, before the lights go out, is Sean Fitzgerald's contribution to this as well uh, in his new book, which will be out soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.